You're listening to an Ono Media podcast. Good morning, and thanks for joining me for Rise in Crime, your morning caffeine hit all about crime. I'm Mama Jules, and let's start out today with a case that I have been watching for weeks. And I'm just going to be honest with you guys. I didn't want to bring this story to you. Not because it's not valuable to hear, it's quite the opposite. It's one of the most valuable to hear. But I feared each time I read an update that I would tell you missing three-year-old Elijah View's story. And then as the podcast would drop, they would find him dead or find evidence of horrible things happening to this beautiful little toddler. But it's been seven weeks and a new development on Monday made me say, it's time to bring the update. So this disappearance is happening in Manitowoc County, Wisconsin, and Katrina Bauer and her boyfriend, Jesse Vang, are raising little three-year-old Elijah. But if it's a loving environment, that's deeply in question because see, Katrina wants Jesse to be the disciplinarian of Elijah. And for the little boy, that means punishments called timeouts. Now I use timeouts with my kids in order for them to mostly learn to regulate their emotions. But those timeouts, well, they lasted for just brief periods. Elijah's timeouts were different. He was forced to stand for one to three hours and pray while standing still in order to contemplate his actions. You guys, he's three years old. Jesse would also make Elijah take cold showers if he dirtied his diaper. And those cold showers were used as a threat when he wouldn't comply with Jesse's demands. Well, in February of this year, Elijah was dropped off at Jesse's apartment on February 12th. Jesse was going to be Elijah's full-time caregiver until February 23rd when his mother was supposed to return. On the morning of February 20th, Jesse told police that he was sleeping on the sofa in the living room when he woke up at 7.30 in order to get his own son ready to catch the bus for school. Jesse says he then woke Elijah up and fed him some cereal, but he didn't change his diaper. Because, see, Jesse said he would change the boy usually only once a day. Well, after he was done eating, he made Elijah stand next to Jesse's bed and pray. And Jesse left him there. And then he promptly fell asleep for three hours. He told authorities when he awoke around 11 o'clock, Elijah was gone and Elijah has been missing ever since. Right, so where's mom? Where's Katrina? Well, it sounded from Jesse's explanation that maybe she was on vacation or possibly out of the area, but she told police she was at her apartment and Elijah was just staying with Jesse except her dates were different than Jesse's. She told police she was set to return on the 20th to pick Elijah up, and Jesse said it was going to be on the 23rd. Now, when police pulled her cell phone records, they discovered that her phone registered location data near Jesse's apartment on the 14th, the 16th, and the 17th. So she lied about her location and her care for Elijah. And Katrina then told officers that she had left Elijah with Jesse to train the child up to be a man. Kind of a sort of boot camp in her words. Again, I just want to remind you guys, he's three years old. Katrina told officers that she wanted Elijah to learn that going home was a privilege. And Jesse admitted to officers that Elijah was scared of him. Jesse also told officers that Elijah had only one toy at Jesse's house. It was a tool set that he had received for Christmas a few months earlier. Except that toy was off limits the entire time of his visit from February 12th to the 20th. And it was off limits because Elijah was in an extended timeout period. Well, there's text messages between Jesse and Katrina during that time frame. And they show Jesse complaining to his girlfriend that Elijah had overfilled his diaper. His punishment for doing so? A cold shower that left him clean but afraid of Jesse. Now, these aren't my words. These are the words Jesse texted to Katrina. Now, on the 20th, after Jesse's 911 call saying he had no idea where Elijah was because he fell asleep and woke up three hours later to find him gone. Well, on that day, search efforts began for a little Elijah. But by the 27th, in a Facebook post, the Two Rivers Police Department wrote that 
they had discovered no significant results in the searches. At that time, they were continuing to search for Elijah in the Kalamut County landfill, as well as the East Twin and West Twin Rivers. They were aided in the searches by Wings of Hope and North Star Search and Rescue. And the TRPD also had used resources from the Wisconsin Army National Guard and the FBI. There's a lot of people searching for this little boy. And do you remember how I started out this podcast telling you that this story was in Manitowoc County? Does that kind of sound familiar? Well, for true crime lovers, it's going to ring a bell because that's the county where the infamous Avery Salvage Yard is located. That's the one that's centered around the conviction of Stephen Avery and his nephew, Brendan Dossey, for the murder of freelance photographer Teresa Halbach. Okay, all of that was the basis for the docuseries Making a Murderer, which chronicled the life of Stephen Avery, who was wrongfully imprisoned for 18 years for the death of Penny Berenson. But following his release, he was accused of murdering Teresa Halbach at the salvage yard. So let's bring those two things together. The search for Elijah at the Avery salvage yard. Well, is it just a geographical connection? Police haven't said, but authorities searched the property Monday since it's located only nine miles from where Elijah was reportedly last seen. Now, Stephen Avery's family did grant voluntary access to the salvage yard for the search, and it's very intriguing. But is it connected? Mm, Probably not. So where does this leave us? Well, on April 4th, a Wisconsin judge found probable cause against 39-year-old Jesse Vang to be charged with felony chronic neglect of a child. And 31-year-old Katrina Bauer will be charged with felony chronic neglect of a child as a party to a crime. That's a lesser charge. It doesn't have as much weight to it. She's also been charged with two counts of resisting or obstructing an officer and one count of neglecting a child. Okay, all of what I said for Katrina, those are misdemeanors. And all of this is per her online court record. Now the resisting or the obstructing of officers charge for Katrina, well, that stems from her lying to police about seeing her child during the month of February. Now, Jesse is slated for a court appearance on April 16th and Katrina will be in court on April 26th. And you should know that this isn't the first brush with the law or even the second for Jesse. He has a juvenile record that includes felony child abuse, but it does have context. See, he attacked a 12-year-old when he was 17. Jesse was at some sort of program area at the Outgamy County Jail when he lashed out at the 12-year-old, punching him multiple times and striking him with a chair repeatedly. Okay, and then he also spent three years in federal prison from 2018 to 2021 for conspiracy to distribute methamphetamine. So there's a pass there. If you can aid investigators at all in finding or uncovering any information about Elijah, you can call the Two Rivers Police Department at 844-267-6648. Elijah weighs about 50 pounds. He has brown eyes and dark blonde hair. He does have a birthmark on his left knee. He was last seen wearing gray pants, a long-sleeved dark-colored shirt, and red and green dinosaur slip-on shoes. At that time, he could have possibly had his red and white plaid blanket with him. Now, that blanket has since been recovered in one of the searches about 3.7 miles from Jesse's apartment. Now, Elijah's uncle, Orson View, told WDJT that the family has been drained by the search effort, but they've also been touched to see strangers organize searches for the toddler. He said the following, It means everything, to be honest. If it was just me and my family doing the search, I don't know what we'd even do. With the whole world really reaching out, giving their support and their love, it means the world and we couldn't do it without them. All right, you know I have to bring you this story out of Detroit. Last week, 32-year-old Aaron Brown and his wife ordered food at the dine-in counter of the Chipotle restaurant in Oakland County. Now, before I tell you the entirety of the story, it's important to note that this Chipotle is across from the Southfield Police Headquarters. Well, as Brown and his wife were standing at the register completing their order, Brown asked the young female employee for extra guacamole. He didn't feel like the amount that he had been given with his food was adequate. Well, even after the worker addressed his needs, Mr. Brown became upset and called the young woman the B-word, 
which understandably upset the other employees. And these are good coworkers because they began escorting the young female who had just been verbally assaulted by Brown. Well, they took her away from the register. But this left the front counter unattended. And Brown walked around the counter and grabbed a to-go cup and started scooping guacamole into the cup. As Brown was making himself at home, a 21-year-old male worker came out from the kitchen area and saw what Brown was doing. And clearly bothered by his lack of manners, the young man knocked the guacamole-filled cup out of Brown's hand. And this is when the scuffle ensued. Brown grabbed the young man by the neck and slammed him into a refrigerator. As they tussled out from behind the counter, Brown pulled out a 9 millimeter handgun that he was concealed carrying on his hip, and he fired one shot, hitting the 21-year-old male in the right knee. Now, the diners in the restaurant scrambled, exiting the Chipotle in search of safety. But what does Mr. Brown do? He steps over his victim and returns to the counter and calmly grabs his bag of food and exits the establishment. Now, I'm going to play you a video of the scene as it unfolded. One of the diners was filming the disturbance. That is up until you hear the gunshot, and then they hightail it out of the restaurant. And I can't blame them. Here, give it a listen. That's a chaotic 26 seconds. So let's clear up some details. Brown was pulled over and arrested just a few minutes after the shooting. The police were right across the street. And Brown did have a concealed carry permit, and he does not have any prior criminal convictions. Not what you thought I was going to say, huh? Also, Brown's wife was not charged with any crime, despite being handcuffed for a brief period. Now, following his arrest, Brown was charged with assault with an intent to do great bodily harm and also discharging a weapon inside a building, causing injury. And then he was also charged with two counts of possession of a firearm in the commission of a felony. He has been jailed on a $20,000 bond. Brown could face up to 12 years in prison for the combined maximum punishments of his crimes if he is found guilty. Now, it's pretty likely there's going to be a plea deal or he's going to be found guilty since we know for certain the video evidence that I shared with you exists, as well as the store's security footage that Southfield police shared at their press conference, which shows the episode unfolding as well. Now, Southfield police chief Elvin Barron said in that press conference that a lot of questions have emerged about what happened. He said, He would suggest that this incident happened because of poor decision-making and an inability to control one's emotions. And there is some good news. The 21-year-old victim was hospitalized and was listed in stable condition as I recorded this episode. He is expected to make a full recovery. And all of this over guacamole. And a quick update to the murder of Parker League. I brought you this story back in both June and July of last year, but now a grand jury has indicted a man for the murder and we have a potential trial date. Okay, let me remind you of the story. 19-year-old Parker League, who lived in Nebraska, was celebrating his recent high school graduation that had just occurred in May of 2023. He had traveled to Tempe, Arizona to celebrate with friends. He was in contact with his brother and even had a return date to Nebraska, which was June 12th. But when that date came, it wasn't at home where they found him. Instead, they found him dead and burned in a bonfire pit He was actually still smoldering, and this pit was in a remote area named Bullfrog Canyon in the Tonto National Forest. Now, according to court documents, Parker had also been stabbed in the back several times, and portions of his body had been dismembered. Unfortunately, his family back in Nebraska, who was looking for him, and then also the police in Arizona, who were trying to identify this burned body, well, they didn't meet up for five days. But despite having no answers over those five days, Parker's family wasn't just sitting by. 
they had been conducting their own investigation trying to find Parker, and they had discovered that Parker's debit card had been used at various locations, and also it had been used to pay someone's power bill. When Maricopa County Sheriff's Office and Parker's family finally shared information, the investigators now had a head start, and it didn't take them long to link those debit card transactions to 37-year-old Anthony Runard. They even had a video of Anthony and Parker leaving a convenience store together in Anthony's black Dodge Challenger. Now, investigators searched that trunk, and they found blood belonging to Parker. And some things have changed since his initial arrest and the grand jury indictment. See, right off the bat, Anthony was charged with first-degree murder. But following the months-long investigation, that has been downgraded now to second-degree murder, as well as abandonment or concealment of a dead body. We also learned more disturbing details of the crime. Court documents reveal that an unknown sharp object was used to stab Parker in the back numerous times, and then an unknown sharp weapon was used to dismember and decapitate him. Parker's head and hands were removed and positioned near his legs. We also discovered in the court documents that Parker had been dropped off on June 11th. That was the day before he was found burning. Well, he'd been dropped off at a Phoenix nightclub. Then video evidence shows Anthony and a woman arriving at the club a few minutes later. Then after an hour, the three leave together. It was also revealed in the court documents that Anthony was found with about $27,000 worth of cocaine. He told arresting officers that he had used both marijuana and cocaine on that June 11th and that the drugs may have blurred his memory. Well, here's how the charges play out. On May 8th, Anthony is scheduled to go to trial for all the drug charges and then also the credit card theft. Now, I totally understand why the drug charges are separate from the second degree murder charge, but I would think the credit card theft since it allegedly occurred while Parker and Anthony were together, that those would be part of the murder trial that is scheduled to begin on July 17th. Now, I'd love to hear if somebody has a legit answer as to why the credit card fraud isn't part of the murder charge. Just let me know. I always like to learn why do these things happen in these cases. And for his part, Anthony is saying, in regards to the credit cards, that he bought those cards from Parker at the convenience store. That's his reasoning for having them and using them fraudulently. Now, this has had to be a very long year for Parker's family. I hope they have found some sort of comfort knowing the process is now moving forward. All right, a quick update to the sentencing portion of Jennifer and James Crumley. They are the parents of Ethan Crumley, who shot and killed four fellow students at his high school in Oxford, Michigan. Jennifer and James Crumley are the first parents that have been held criminally liable for the actions of a child. And in this case, those actions amounted to murder. Well, at the sentencing hearing, Nicole, who is the mother of one of the murdered students, Madison Baldwin, well, she said the following, you said you wouldn't do anything different. Well, that really says what type of parent you are because there's a lot of things I would do differently. Then she said, the one thing I would have wanted to be different was to take that bullet that day so Madison could continue to live the life she deserved. Well, following the statements by parents of the victims and also by Jennifer and James Crumley, the judge sentenced each parent to 10 to 15 years in prison. Now, here's a little bit of audio from Judge Cheryl Matthews. I'm very aware of my job in the situation, very aware of my job uh, to not be uh, swayed uh, by public opinion, by media, by any of those different things. I can't and um, will not pretend to understand the pain the families are experiencing, but I did sit through these trials with you. I saw what you saw, I heard what you heard, so I can and will offer my deepest and most sincere condolences for your unfathomable, well, unfathomable losses. It's, it's, as I just said, it's not, it's not my role, it's not the role of the court system to make an example of the defendants. However, it is a goal of sentencing to act as a deterrent. These charges are not jury edicts about gun ownership or keeping a gun in a private home. All of the jurors in both trials agreed that they understood that. Parenting is a complex job. Parenting practices around the world share the goals of ensuring health and safety, 
preparation for life as a productive adult, and transmission of cultural values. Parents are not expected to be psychic. But these convictions are not about poor parenting. These convictions confirm repeated acts or lack of acts that could have halted an oncoming runaway train about repeatedly ignoring things that would make a reasonable person feel the hair on the back of their neck stand up. Opportunity knocked over and over again, louder and louder, and was ignored. No, one's, no one answered, and these two people should have and sure didn't. Mr. Crumley, it's clear to this court that because of you, there was unfettered access to a gun or guns as well as ammunition in your home. You characterized yourself as a martyr and threatened the well-being of the prosecutor. Mrs. Crumley, you glorified the use and possession of these weapons. Your attitude toward your son and his behaviors was dispassionate and apathetic. Your response to school staff after a 12-minute meeting was, are we done here? During your trial, you announced that you wouldn't do anything different. I understand that that might have been uh, misinterpreted, but it did cut the victims deep. Now, I couldn't agree more with the judge here. The actions of these parents deepened the already unhealable wounds that were inflicted by their son, Ethan. I think we should honor those who died in this shooting by at a minimum saying their names one more time. Those murdered were Justin Schilling, Madison Baldwin, Tate Meyer and Hannah St. Juliana. Seven other people were injured in the mass shooting that occurred on November 30th of 2021. And let's end with this story out of Las Vegas. And what a crazy ride this is. On Monday, three people were killed in a law office, not usually the place where misguided people will settle their domestic disputes with violence. But here's how it went down. Las Vegas lawyer Dylan Edward Houston was married to and shared children with Ashley Houston. But the four-year marriage ended in October of 2021 when Ashley filed for divorce from Dylan. Just one month later, a divorce decree was issued, and in that decree, the two shared joint physical and legal custody of the children. Now, Ashley and Dylan were close in age, somewhere in their 30s. Since the divorce, Ashley has moved on to a new husband, Another lawyer named Dennis Prince, who is listed as in his 50s. Ashley had also used Dennis Prince to represent her in the divorce from Dylan. So her bulldog attorney has now become her husband. Now, after the two were married, they together were blessed with a baby girl just three months ago. Okay, let me catch you up because this could be really confusing. Ashley has two kids with Dylan and now she has one kid with Dennis. All right. The disputes between Ashley and Dylan, they weren't over with the divorce. A new court filing concerning the custody was filed just last month, which led Ashley, her ex-husband Dylan, her new husband Dennis, and her ex-father-in-law Joseph W. Houston II, who's also a lawyer, to all be in the same law office together, same conference room together, to participate in a contentious deposition. As they argued over the custody of the children that Dylan and Ashley shared, seven total people were in the room. Ashley, Dennis, Dylan, and Joseph. We know that leaves three more people. One of those was the court reporter and then two others, maybe law clerks. Well, three to four minutes into the deposition, it is alleged that Joseph, the lawyer in his 70s, stood up and began firing across the table, aiming directly for Dennis and Ashley. The court reporter and the two other people scurried from the room. They were even shooed away by the gunman, this according to Las Vegas police. Ashley and Dennis were both killed in the gunfire, and police say the gunman then took his own life. And Dylan witnessed the whole thing. Well, chaos erupted in the large office building that housed multiple businesses. Most of the building's occupants took shelter in place, locking the doors to their businesses and allowing officials to systematically go through the building, checking on the hundreds of people left stranded. And later that day, the Las Vegas Review Journal reported that police blocked off the street where the alleged gunman, Joseph Houston, lived. And after they blocked off the street, armed SWAT officers threw a flash bomb inside the home. 
They used loudspeakers to tell anyone inside the home to vacate. I don't know what they found in that search. It's still so new. Like I said, this happened on Monday. I do want to share this bit of information, and I want to note that it's only been confirmed on social media, and then I also saw it on Fox News. So I just want you to know where I get my information from. I don't ever want to mislead you. There are people who worked on Ashley's custody battle that have said that Joseph Houston, that's the gunman who was in his 70s, that he was terminally ill with cancer at the time. Again, that hasn't come directly from law enforcement. Now, veteran attorney Will Kemp said he had known Dennis Prince for 25 years. He told reporters that it goes without being said that Dennis was a fantastic lawyer. And Nevada Attorney General Aaron Ford wrote on social media, here's what he said, Dennis Prince was not only a brilliant attorney, but he was also my former law partner and my friend. I can't believe he's gone. I'm extremely saddened by his and Ashley's death and my heart goes out to their families, especially their children. And John Curtis, a deputy city attorney with the city of Las Vegas, said he had known Dennis Prince and Joseph Houston for decades. Curtis said both lawyers were respected, and then he characterized it this way. He said Houston was a little rough around the edges, but nothing to indicate this type of behavior. And then he described Dennis Prince as a heavyweight and a kind of superstar in the litigation field. Now, Houston's family released a statement to Fox 5 Vegas asking the public to wait to draw conclusions until police have a chance to finish their investigation. Here's how the statement reads. Our family is in a state of profound shock and sadness at yesterday's events. We ask for prayers and privacy as we try to navigate the coming days. Then it goes on to read, The Las Vegas Metropolitan Police Department is still conducting their investigation. And as that continues, speculation about details of the incident only serves to add trauma to our already grieving and overwhelmed families. We have full faith in Metro's efforts and will leave all future comments to them as their investigation unfolds. I'll keep you updated if there's any more news on this Las Vegas story. Well, that's your Thursday episode of Rise and Crime. Can we have a moment of celebration together? This is episode 100 of Rise and Crime. Thanks for being here with me. I say it all the time. I have the best of audiences on Rise and Crime, and I know Peyton and Garrett feel exactly the same way. Here's to hundreds more. If you're watching on YouTube, please take a moment to like this video. And if you're listening on podcast or on YouTube, please subscribe. And you guys, thanks for all the case suggestions. You can join me again on Monday for more morning crime news. I'm Mama Jules, and keep safe out there.